Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live and tonight we have Ty Olson as our special guest who has been in way too much stuff to list right now. How you doing Ty? I'm good brother, how you doing? I'm doing great and as I told Ty, I've really been looking forward to this conversation and let's get right to it. Uh, Planet of the Apes, I'm a huge Planet of the Apes fan, uh, fan. I mean I remember as a little kid you know, Charleston Heston, Charleston Heston, sorry, and that amazing movie. And the reason I became such a big Planet of the Apes fan at such a young age was because my older brother loved Planet of the Apes, and it just became ingrained in me. Uh, Were you a fan of the franchise before you took on any role in it? Uh, I was, but... um... You know, I, I don't think I was a rabid fan, but I remember watching the movies and, and enjoying them. I didn't uh, I didn't watch a lot of television growing up. I actually, I mean, <laughs> I'm aging myself here, but I, I grew up in some rural areas that you had like three channels. So, um, you know, you watched, uh, I'm a Canadian, you watch Hockey Night in Canada yeah. and the little hobo, and, and that was about it, the, the majority of what you watch. So, uh, but I do remember watching it throughout the years, but um I got more acquainted with it, obviously, as, as uh, I started auditioning for roles on it. Uh, I'll, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those classics. You can't avoid it. Uh, yeah. Now, the reboots, all of them, are amazing. Uh, the way they brought this franchise back to life is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, when you eventually did see the original and get, you know, and you saw the, the old movies and you compared it to what they were doing with the reboots, uh, what did you think about the reboots? Uh, I agree with you. I think they did a spectacular job reinventing the whole premise and theory of how it happened and, and uh, in the first place, uh, which, which was really creepy. That first movie was a really creepy um, idea about how uh, how we did it to ourselves, yeah. and especially it, it kind of in a, a time when we're in a global pandemic too. And it's <clears throat> the idea of, <clears throat> and I don't believe this, but the idea of a of a virus, an experimental virus, getting out of a lab and all that, and right, it's uh, here we it's are. Uh, the, the science is kind of scary interesting in these movies, and I think they, the reboot really um, made the most of that. And you know what I found fascinating is uh, the Easter the Easter eggs that they put in that first one, like with the space launch. Uh, yeah. And they sort of tied it together. Uh, I love that. I love those little Easter eggs that they put in the movies. Now, there are quite a few people out there that believe that the apes – throughout the in the new friend in the new reboots are completely cgi they're not even real people it's all computer generated they cannot be further that cannot be further from the truth the yeah, people no, no. that play the roles and your role in war was red donkey and we're going to get more to him in a second but explain to us the process of turning the actor like yourself into a gorilla well, these days, they uh, I mean, uh, it's its evolved so quickly over the last couple of decades from like Lord of the Rings. It's just, you know, from then on, it's just push, push, push this, the, the new technology towards animating actors. And um, the most famous actor, Andy Serkis, has been, you know, at the forefront of, of a lot of the performances. Um, uh, they have a it's like a gray suit, a very unflattering gray suit um, that has white dots on it. And then they put the dots <clears throat> make up white dots on your face as well. My understanding is the computer catches those dots, those dots as, as kind of um, mobility points so that they know they, they can take, take the CGI animation and connect it to those dots. So we're in suits and we're acting the whole thing out. They just layer the, the, the image of the ape on top of us. And it's, it's kind of cool to watch. Um, a few weeks into, into shooting, they finally got us, when we got into the studio, they could put up a monitor so we could see ourselves in not fully not fully animated not fully um, done but rendered but we could see a gorilla moving around as we moved i could move and i could do a dance and the gorilla would do a dance it was <laughs> you know so trippy to to be part of that process now andy circus who uh plays caesar uh mm-hmm. and he was also in the lord of the rings and all that great actor <clears throat> I saw a special after the first Planet of the Apes movie came out of him doing exactly what you described. It looked to be very physically intense. Uh, it is. Would you say it was the most? This has been the most exhausting, physically exhausting role you ever had to do. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I'll tell you what's, what's interesting is Mike. So we did like an ape school for three weeks before uh, we had, I had four auditions for the uh, for the part, and then we did a three week ape school. And you know, you'd be scheduled for the entire day, but after about two hours, your body was shot. Mm-hmm. You were like, "I'm out." Um, the the quadrupeding with the with the um, <clears throat> the braces that they give you, they're like, um, so you're you're in this position that you never use, and you're you're hunkered down, so your thighs and your your buttocks and stuff are just working all the time. Your back, and <clears throat> um, it was pretty grueling. But we, we did enough of it in the rehearsal that come shoot time, it was second nature. So Now, when you were doing that training, who did they bring in to help train you guys in your movements to imitate the apes? Uh, Terry Notary. Notary? I hope I got his last name right. Uh, he's, he's been there since the beginning, and he kind of developed the system. Um, and a uh, fantastic stunt actor and actor and... Uh, and he kind of led the uh, the ape school, and then he also plays. Oh, I can't remember the character, but he's also been been one of the characters in the movie for uh, since the beginning. That is so um, cool. And uh, did, yeah. did they have anybody who's uh, trained in handling primates like uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, or anything like that? No, no. I think um, I think we. I mean, we did our individual research about ten, how to act and stuff like that. But I think, but um, I can't remember if we had a coach. But I think he was. I think it was just him for the physicality. Okay. And the, I mean, three weeks we covered a lot of ground. It's an interesting thing though because when you're going into play, we weren't going into play strictly animals. You're going into play as hybrid, highly intelligent, um, kind of a, almost like a mixed yeah. breed of gorilla. So, um, so in a way, it's like yes, we we wanted to do our research and look at uh, real chimpanzees and primates, but. Um, but at the end of the day, we also had to realize they have so many human characteristics that it does it's not all applicable. Yeah. And in fact, my character, we decided um, that we'd make him primarily stand up. And then, even though I trained in it, I didn't actually quadruped in the movie because we decided that Red Donkey, being a uh, turncoat, was trying to be human. Mm-hmm. So he wa- he stood the, the whole time. And there's a I think it's I can't remember what zoo it was, but we found an example of a gorilla that in a zoo that was that would walk on his hind legs primarily. Wow. So we used that as a reference for my character because we decided my character should never be quadrupeding. I, well, I kind of decided, and, 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 and um, Matt Reeves kind of agreed, I'm like, he should never walk. If he thinks he's trying to be with the humans, then he let him be as human as possible. But the, the sad irony is, of course, the humans were never going to see him as one of theirs. Never accept and him. Being a traitor and a turncoat, his own kind was we're never going to accept them either. That's true. Um, which to me, is one of the interesting pieces of the story with that character. And we're going to get to more of that in uh, in a second. Let's go back to the first one, where you played a human. You played Chief John Hamill, I believe your character's name was. Was uh, that third act in Rise of Planet of the Apes? Wow, with the uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. You being on in the helicopter in the lab, eventually ending up on the Golden Gate Bridge, absolutely crazy, awesome third act to any movie. Yeah. Uh, what was it like shooting that? Uh, was it just, I mean, I, the the scale? I can't even imagine uh, the the amount of people, the budget, the shooting. What was that yeah. experience like? We had a, they had a huge animatronic uh, skeleton of a helicopter built on gimbals so that they could play the whole thing, uh, how it bounced, how it moved, how it flew, how it rose. It was like being on a um, roller coaster. It was like being on an amusement ride. I, I can't even begin to, to guess what the cost of that thing was. Wow. But um, none of it was, I mean, we had, I think, one shot in an actual helicopter. Uh, and the rest was all done on this gimbal uh, against a green screen. Um, but it allowed you to have that that motion instead of like, you know, the old Star Trek where everybody leans to the left. Oh, we're falling. Oh, we're falling. You didn't have to do any of that. This thing jerked you around like I'm sure it could give you whiplash if they wanted to crank it up to 10. Um, you know, what's interesting is um, <clears throat> the, uh, although I've played lots of them. In a funny way, sometimes those the cops and the guards and stuff can be some of the harder roles because they're expected to be military esque and they're expected to not have a lot of kind of you know they're, they're supposed to fill a role yeah. that, you know and and so sometimes it's a little bit harder to kind of grab onto things what you know what's his journey what's his story what how does he feel about this mm-hmm. 
uh, so in its own way, that character was it was as challenging as as playing Red Donkey because because it, those characters they just they live in between worlds. Mm-hmm. And there's a they're a bit of a service character, but they also have to have a life and and goals and and fears and wants and needs of their own. Um, but they're also you know they're not they're not central to the plot to, to a point where uh, they're just usually not written with a lot of I life. totally get it yeah yeah so you, have to, you have to find the life within them and with on less information where if the bigger the role is the more well written it is the more information you have the more depth that's inherently in the character the more you have to pull from so um it's interesting it was, you know, they're they're challenging in different ways. You got to you create know? your own backstory for yeah. to, to do your a job. Lot more stuff you have to bring to the table. Yeah, that's not peppered in there. And that you can go, oh, I'll take that. I'll take that. You got to go. Okay, I got to make decisions on my own for this one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, walk us through. How did you get the part of uh, Chief John Hamill? Uh, obviously, you auditioned. Did you specifically audition for that part? Did you get called in a- for just a? A very vague audition, and that's the part they gave you. I'll tell you, it's a bit of a funny story, actually. And I had forgotten this until you uh, until you just asked that question. So, I had gone in for that role, and um, I had I was really busy at the time. I'd been working on a ton of shows, and one of the things that when you're on shows, like if you, if I have a show with a beard on, and then I audition for another show, uh, then they keep the beard and. Sometimes you'll end up like having a beard for two years because you go from one show to another show to another show and you can't cut it and you can't cut your hair or they always cut the hair and stuff. So I was so busy at the time that I had gotten I, I hadn't been able to cut my own hair or, or or do anything that was my choice. So I just for a brief period had a lull in work. So I decided to give myself a mohawk because <laughs> I like, why not? I haven't had a mohawk in, since I was a teenager. So I dyed it blonde, shaved into a mohawk. And I literally the next day I had an audition for Planet of the Apes, and I went, oh, "Damn it, I'm not going to shave. I just, I've only had it one day." So I and I thought, okay, and they they're of course very secretive. So I didn't know if I was playing an ape. I didn't know if I was playing a human. I like because in the old movies, like the cop could have been a gorilla, mm-hmm. right? Like that was a literal, you know. So I went, okay, I'm not going to worry about the hair because I don't know what the plan is. So I go in and I do the role, I kill it. Uh, and then I hear back like two days later, oh, they couldn't see past the mohawk. And I was like, literally, guys, it's a 30 seconds zzz, zzz, and it's a military cut. Um, so I, two weeks later after that, I go in for a different role. By then I have cut the hair because now I've had so many auditions and I'm like, okay, I can shave. And I've had it for a week. I could. So I go in and it's just real close, crop cut military. And um, I'm ready. I'm, going, I'm, I'm standing by to go in next. And the door opens and the actor comes out who was in before me and they see me through the doorway and they close the door and then they come. The reader comes back and goes, they want you to read for Hammond again. Ah. And, I'm like, and I'm like, oh, oh okay. But I read, I mean, I, I'm not going to do better than I did two weeks ago prepped. So I take it. I've refreshed myself. I go in and I book the job. Wow. And I'm, I'm like, guys, really? You think this industry is so creative? And I'm like, you can't get over one strip of hair. Mm-hmm. And like, by that time, even I, you know, I still had a resume to support it. I had a killer audition. Uh, so that's how I ended up getting it two weeks later. And I started shooting two days after that. Wow. They were so they had character. So now, did your role uh, in the first one help you get the bigger role as the gorilla in war? I don't think so. Um, I really don't think so because it was a whole, it was a whole new director uh, and a lot of new uh, a lot of new people behind it. So I don't think there was any. In fact, you know, as as is often the case that you know the new director has a new vision and Matt Reeves is so brilliant mm-hmm. that um, that I think he probably would have preferred not to have any replacements. But um, but luckily it didn't matter. It's not you know it's not like they were going to see my face. So they're like he's great. Um, so. Uh, how cool is it that I play two different parts? A human I know, and-, and that leads me to my next question. Uh, you, Red, was uh, an essential part to War of Planet of the Apes, uh, but you were an ape. How does it feel? Yeah. Do you feel like a little bit, um, I don't know what the right word is, not recognized outside to fans uh, because you were a gorilla, but yet, was such a vital part of a movie. Uh, how does that make you feel? 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you another quick little anecdotal story. Uh, I was not, at the time of that movie, I was not in a great place in my life. I had a lot of personal things going on and, and a lot of, um, uh, mar- like divorce was happening. Mm-hmm. A bunch of stuff was happening and I was not in a good place. And, I, and, um, we, so when they offered the role, we, we, you know, you negotiate your fee and I've been doing this 17 years at the time. And, um, and I, I ended up getting mad at them. I'm like, I've already been in one. I already gave you a deal in the first movie. And, and they're like, yeah, but this is a different movie. I'm like, yeah, but I gave you a deal in the first one. So I, now you can pay what I want you to pay, you know, at a reasonable amount. Yeah. I'm like, you guys, you guys are going to, I've been doing this 17 years. You're not going to hardline me. Um, and, but the attitude from everybody is like, but it's so big. It's such a big movie. I'm like, and I, I, I'll ask you this question. I'm going to quiz you. Other than Andy Serkis, name me one other famous motion actor, mo- motion uh, capture actor. In war? Anybody. Famous. I can't. Exactly. And that's what I said to them. I'm like, nobody's going to fucking know who I am, people. I don't, I'm, like, I'm like, you either pay me or you give me some bump in my career. Like, get, give me something to launch my career off. Because nobody's going to know me. Yeah. And they're like, but you can't turn this down. I'm like, yeah, I just did. <laughs> And I, I ended up turning it down a few times, and it wasn't, you know, probably wasn't wise, but I was just, in, I was kind of in an angry place at the industry, you know, mm-hmm. that 17 years in, there you're trying to save money on on me. Don't don't do that. No, no, and, especially and, uh, with the budget that I assume they had to work with. Dude, well, that was one of the arguments I gave. I was like, I looked up what your last movie did. You made a half a billion dollars. I, I'm not going to be the one to break your budget, <laughs> man. <laughs> uh, so, That's yeah. a great story, and you know what? You got the role. And I yeah. hope you got exactly what you asked for as well. And it wasn't it wasn't outrageous. No. It was just what I deserved. So now, yeah. playing Red Donkey, you call him a turncoat, which is absolutely appropriate. He's like that uh, outside high schooler that wants to get in with the cool kids. In yeah. this case, it's the ape wanting to be more like the humans. And you have this big, overpowering ape that's Red Donkey. And he's a guard, but yet he's subservient to the humans and takes orders and is basically their slave. How uh, the writing was more intense for Red than you said in the character for Rise. Uh, Did they really fill you in and give you a... I don't know if you can give a backstory to a gorilla, but uh, what made Red tick? in order for you to portray what they wanted? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked about it pretty extensively, and I think the, the major thing is, is we were ta- they're talking about um, a, a war to uh, genocide, right? Both sides were looking to, war, to, to commit genocide on the other species. And I think that the bottom line was that Red Donkey just thought that he wanted to be on the winning side. Um, and, I, you know, I think when, when your very life and your existence is at stake, we, we like to all think that we're going to be the brave ones. We like to think that we're all going to be the heroes. But the truth is, a lot of us will just side with... I mean, we've seen such yeah. atrocities through history of people just siding with the side because they're afraid. Exactly. I mean, we, we, there's an entire world war based on that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, a lot of people just went because they were afraid. And I think Red Donkey, the saddest thing about that character is that it was a fear-based decision, really. He was afraid. He was afraid to to, uh, to lose his life. He was afraid to be on the losing side, and it's. I mean, it doesn't make for the hero of the movie, but it. But it makes it real. Very and realistic. I think, I think that's what made Red Donkey very real. Uh, is that, is that he? Because that would happen. You would get turncoats. You would get people who are like my life is more important than, than your cause. Your cause. And I think that was the saddest part about um, his storyline, is that he really believed, and that was, of course, what what Caesar and he kept having these little debates about. He was like, "They don't, they're, they're, you're never going to be one of them," mm-hmm. you're, you're, you know. And, um, no. So, I mean, it's it's. I like to say that acting is simple in its design, complex in its execution, but simple in, in its in its design. Like the humans and human like primates, you know. It always comes down to like money, love, lust, power, jealousy. There's very simple themes, right? Mm-hmm. And if you look at those five, that covers almost everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, 
I think it was a power and fear and and you know, it's uh, he just wanted to be he wanted to stay alive. He wanted to he stay alive. Surprised. That's everyone's basic instinct right there. Yep. Red has the uh, best redemption in the movie. Very short lived, but at the end when he sees Caesar uh, with all odds against the apes, still yeah. uh, Caesar is wounded, but he's still fighting the fight. And uh, the the human orders you to get him the grenade launcher and you turn around and you see Caesar in that moment. What do you think clicks in red uh, that makes him make that decision that he really would would know that he would get killed for it. He, he basically yeah. sacrificed his life either for the cause or to help Caesar. What do you think clicked in red in that moment when he saw Caesar battling on against all odds? Well, I'm glad you asked that because going back to the story about me saying no so many times, uh, no, when I finally knew what the full story of the character was, I'm so glad I got the role. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I didn't know the full storyline. Like that wasn't given to me either. So, um, what? But what a treat to play because I think, in answer to your question, I think you know he was trying to redeem his soul. You know, he was. He realized that as he saw in Caesar everything he was not. And where jealousy and hurt and resentment was had been fueling his anger towards him, in that moment, I think he just, I think he just he saw all the things that he wasn't, and um, and and I think it just hit him to a, in a in a very deep, deep primal place where he suddenly. It, it was as much uh, to redeem his own soul as it was to help Caesar. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even, you know, they say there's no true uh, altruistic kind of behavior. And even, I think even in that, there was part of him that needed to, needed to, he probably, you know, he, he was rotting inside all these things, betraying his people, betraying the, the cause, betraying uh, the primates and, and giving himself over. Like, I mean, we think of gorillas, you know, they're like alpha primal beasts. Like these, they're not, no. they don't. You know, they don't get shackled and do others bidding, no. others bidding. No. So I think it was all of that. I think he had, he just, he realized he couldn't live anymore yeah. being this kind of Swiss cheese rotting kind of soul. And it went a lovely thing again, because we don't think of animals as having souls. But clearly in that moment for him, uh, there was only one answer to, to re redeem himself. And that was to say, Caesar, I absolutely agree. And it was one of the most powerful moments in that whole movie. Uh, I love the twist that we had throughout the whole movie where we saw the de-evolution of the humans. They yeah. were the ones getting sick. And yeah. of course the apes were immune to it. Uh, what did you think of that part of the story? I think it played in beautifully. And especially in the end when Woody Harrelson's character uh, succumbed to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think again, it's brilliant. It's just brilliant storytelling and what fantastic writing uh, for, for them the way they introduced the virus uh the way they introduced the the uh higher the elevated intelligence in, in the primates and then also to help explain like the decimation of humanity like yeah. because we know it's it's always interesting doing a story where you kind of know where it's going do you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like telling a bible you know telling a bible story we all know that Jesus ends up on the cross. Yeah. So how do you keep it interesting to get there, so to speak? Um, and that's kind of true with the series too. We kind of know where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to make sense of it, but we have to keep it interesting and believable. And more than anything, I think one of the things that they did with this, with the reincarnation of this series is they made all that stuff really, really viable and believable and i think that's that's a key ingredient of, of us being able to understand how could this happen yep. where all the humans suddenly are disappearing off the planet and and the apes are like really come on yeah how does that because uh, you can't just say it doesn't matter how intelligent they are they didn't just take over militaries exactly right the, the virus affected the humankind's negatively and um yeah i think they just and, the, and the apes thrived now yeah. uh I assume you have no information on this, so I'm going to ask you this as a, as a fellow fan. Uh, do you think it should stay as it is, the way war ended, and leave the franchise alone? Or 
as let's say you were the filmmaker, okay, you were in charge of this franchise. Do you go now and fast now that Caesar is dead forward into the future and let's say pick up where the original Planet of the Apes was back in the 60s in a modern way? How do you feel if you were the filmmaker? Do you leave the franchise alone and just let it go? Or do you push it on to give us an actual remake of the original movie with Heston? I don't know that an actual remake is the answer, but if you, I think if you were going to explore continuing down that that road, it all depends on the integrity of the script and the storytelling involved, obviously. Because you could have said, lots of people could have said, you should, you should never have touched the originals to begin with. Yeah. It should never have been remade. So um, I, I'd like to leave it open to, to creative genius to be genius. Yeah. And uh, the, the team behind this this um, rebirth of the series is genius. Oh, yeah. They're all been, it's, it's really brilliant. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know. It's like, it's if they can pull it off, it, but it's all about keeping the integrity, right? Yeah. If you can't, then don't. And I think that's that's always the thing. If you really can't continue the story with integrity to the same level of storytelling that you did with the first three, then leave it alone. Um, but that's, you know, that's easier said than done. I know. I know. Especially when we know it all comes down to money and it, yeah. they were so successful. They were so well done. Uh, yeah. I got to ask you this question. Let, let, let me go one step further to, to your question, too, because here's the thing. Sometimes when you are part of cinematic history, you do. It's like I'm a big fight fan, a big UFC MMA fan. And, and when you see your stars who are aging and starting to lose and who were brilliant and, and, and un, nearly undefeated and and were like real true warriors and you start to see them um lose their ability and start to get knocked out or start to lose frequently and stuff. It's that argument with like a sports thing. Yeah. Do we let them play because they love to play or do we say, Hey guys, for your own safety and health, it's time for you to step back. It's a tough one to do, right? It is. It is. A man, I, I, I'm somebody who gets carried away. I love care. Like there's movies and, and themes that I will literally like enjoy in my head for years afterwards, yeah. you know? Um, I'm the and, same way. Uh, you don't want people to mess with it. Mm -mm. But at the same time, you're like, if you could do it, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I got to ask you, uh, you explained in the beginning of this interview with the dots, how it was all filmed and your portrayal to a gorilla. Uh, did they do that uh, on a soundstage in a studio and then put you on the location through computer graphics? Or were you there on set with the dots and the whole get up as everyone else was filming as well? We were on set, on location, and in fact, that major uh, where a lot of the the whole end stuff happens in the big compound, the military compound, that was like a quarter built reel, and then these giants. I've never seen green screens so high. They were probably I don't know five, I don't know, four or five stories high, wow. it, surrounding like a football field of space in a big circle, and then it facing the this the real. Um, set pieces um, so we were on we were on the whole time pa you know you'd have power packs plugged in and helmet cams and it's such a bizarre thing to have a helmet with a camera that comes in and is looking at your face like this the whole time wow. while you're acting so bizarre and in, in fact sometimes the other person's um, camera would get in front and we'd hook because it'd be too if you got too close to the other person the two cameras would hook together <laughs> be like hold on a second we're gonna pull off <laughs> Now, is it true that Red was supposed to be a chimpanzee, but because it is. they really wanted you for the role, they changed it to a gorilla? Um, I think I think what happened is during the process of it, they they wanted. Um, I think as they watched me with Andy, and I'm a I'm a pretty large guy, especially in the acting world. I'm a fairly beefy guy, and, and I got a pretty good presence about me. And so I think as they watched us, they kind of just they kind of just went, I think um, he's better suited as a gorilla than another chimp. Like we like the fact that 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 it's a there's a size difference. And we like, and I guess my, to be honest, my energy is probably more gorilla than chimp too. <laughs> and it also makes sense too. If you're going to put an ape to be a guard and work with the humans, you would want yeah. that to be the gorilla. I don't know. To me, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it was a, 
I don't know when they started doing that, but I think it definitely was like while the process was already in, they went, ah, I think we're going to change who this guy is. So when you auditioned, you thought you were going to be playing a chimpanzee. Yeah. Ah, that's interesting. That's very interesting. I did not know that. Now, VFX supervisor Anders Langlands, I hope I said that right, said they uh, they based your character red on a silverback gorilla named Winston from the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. Did you ever actually get to see that gorilla or visit him? I didn't get to visit him, unfortunately, but I I did find videos of him, obviously, and uh, and um, yeah, he walks like a big gorilla standing on two legs. It's and it's a terrifying thing to see because it's it's kind of spooky. Uh-huh. It's it's human like in this six hundred pound body. It's wow. it's so bizarre. If you uh, to the viewers, if you haven't uh, ever seen him youtube him it's it's frightening and he looks friendly but he's just like it's just this massive thing that's just lumbering along standing on two legs it's it's kind of terrifying when you realize like how much weight he's got behind him i I gotta ask you you know the most famous gorilla of all time are you a king kong fan i am yeah Yeah. (laughs) he has to be like the most famous gorilla of all time yeah. and now moving on like i said you've done a lot of stuff in your career you have you were on supernatural for almost its entire run for only 10 episodes but from the beginning all the way almost to the end were you surprised you kept getting the call to come back well here's the thing um i have this weird thing about my career i um we were just talking about how it's interesting that i played two roles in the planet of the apes series and I actually played two different roles in the Supernatural yeah. series. Um, so my first character was in season two. I played Eli, who was a vampire, who was part of a coven that had decided not to eat humans. And and, uh, and then in season eight, I came in as uh, Benny, Bro. who also decided he wasn't going to eat humans. Uh, and then I was, uh, yeah, 10 episodes between, I mean, I was out for a bunch of seasons. And then for eight to 10, I was in a bunch of episodes and stuff. Um, Oh, according to IMDb, it's between 2006 and 2019. That's 13, 14 years. Yeah, but I was in season two for a couple episodes and then a long break without. And then again, so they just count both characters, I think, in that timeline. Yeah. Well, how did, uh, did you like coming to the Supernatural set? Was it just uh, another gig or did you really enjoy your time there? Well, let me tell you, one of the, and I've, said, I've spoken about this at cons and stuff, that um, I've, most of my career has been as a guest. Mm-hmm. I've been a, a guest on many other people's shows, uh, which is a tricky business to be. If you're, if you're the lead and you're the number one that, and it's your show, you just you know everybody. Everybody's there to help you. You've made friends. You, you, like, you feel at home. You feel comfortable. And as a guest, you're always the person going, okay, I hope we get this right today. You know, I hope I fit the genre. I hope everyone's nice to me. I hope I... You know, I'm on my game. I hope I'm not nervous. I'm ho- so. Um, I've done a lot of guest spots in my in my 20 years of of this business, and that set was probably one of the most comfortable and sweet and genuine and giving sets I've ever been on. And the the two lead boys, uh, most of my scenes were with uh, Jensen Ackles, and I've said this many times that um, he did something I've never experienced before. <clears throat> I was outside my trailer looking over my lines we had about a three or four page scene most of it my dialogue he had a couple two or three lines and he came over now he was this is season eight so he's already you know he can memorize his stuff in his sleep Mm -hmm. he knows the character he knows everybody it's it's real comfortable comfortable for him and he's also super busy and young family and all that stuff so when you've been on that show that many times you want your free time the minute between shots and stuff is your free time and he did something I've never experienced. He came over to me and said, uh, hey, good. Is everything good? Is everybody treating you well? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, you want to run your lines with me? And I was like, you've got like three lines. I've got the rest of it. So he wasn't doing it for him. Like it's, okay, you know, it's normal for somebody who's got a lot of dialogue going, hey, can you run it with me? He wasn't running it for him. He was running it for me. That says a lot and about someone. That, that says so much about somebody. Him as a, as a, as a leader, as a as one of the tops in the show and also as a human. And and then he says, do you want to be shot first or do you want me to shoot first? Which is, that's what they do for people who are the leads yeah. who they want to send home early. Like I've been on shows where not only was I not shot first, I was shot last and the lead went home. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sh- shooting with, I'm like talking to the stand-in. Wow. 
so he he was just phenomenal. It blew me away. I, I can't say enough good things about those boys, and and Jared and Jensen. We've hung out um, socially a handful of times, and they're they're as nice on set professionally as they are off set. And um, and I'm so grateful for Supernatural. But the the fandom, as you probably know, is massive. Uh, um, I, I hear those two guys love to bust chops. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're good boys. They're good boys. And the fandom's great. Uh, it's it's like having this big slightly crazy family um behind your back you know or like at your back because they're just they're, there's so many of them and and uh and they're so quirky and loving and crazy and it's it's been a great experience to be part of supernatural and that leads me to my next question you have done a lot of conventions and uh i'm a big fan of conventions horror science fiction all of them and you go to these conventions and you're confronted with the fans and you get to feel that the energy in the room for someone who's never been to a convention, it's really even hard to describe in words. Uh, what was it like, you know, going through COVID where everything was shut down and for you in particular, where you're separated from the fan base and you can't do conventions. And yeah. like all of us, we were stuck in quarantine. Uh, how yeah. did you personally handle that? Uh, I'd like to say well, but that's not entirely true. <laughs> no, a lot of people uh, feel the same way. I, I, I'm a person who is can be intensely private at one hand and then intensely social and outgoing uh, uh, the next day. And so um, I, I like to be around people. In fact, I have this strange thing where if I have a script or if I need to like look at sides, I will often go to the pub and to do it because – the white noise of a people and activity and a little bit of chaos around me makes me feel I can focus. Mm -hmm. That if it's alone at home with a you know empty house and no not a, not a soul around, that's the worst place for me to focus. I can't I can't work on my piece that way. Wow. I kind of I think maybe it's because I was a, I had a kids fairly young, so I I got used to auditioning with like a kid on my hip and like daddy you know daddy daddy. So I don't know if it just that became part of it or what, but. Um, but yeah, conventions. I uh, I've missed them. You know, it's what a fantastic thing for us as actors to be able to connect with fans, um, and travel, and um, and and uh, all. Oh, there's so many pluses that come with conventions, and uh, the, I love the fans. I, and I I have truly, truly missed being able to travel and being able to see them and being able to. I mean, we've all listen. We've all been deprived of hugs and handshakes and 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 just normal human interaction. And for a guy like me, who's a very, very social person, very social butterfly, needs you know needs to be around people. Uh, it can be you know it's a little depressing. Yeah, I don't know. No, I, not I, just for you, for a lot of people. Trust me. Uh, yeah, I mean the whole world needs a vacation, and we're still here. We're still doing. I'm supposed to be in Texas next weekend for one, and they've had to shut it down yeah, because of COVID. Number. Exactly. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm. I'm going to be going to new york comic con which is in person hopefully that doesn't get uh shut down because if you watch the news as we think we're reaching the end it starts getting bad again and you're like when is this ever yeah. gonna end but moving yeah. on you were in the very first episode of black summer uh yeah. i have had the cast on as my guests a great group of people uh it sucks that you you die so quickly. You were Rose's husband. Um, yeah. And that scene is so memorable in the beginning where you try to get onto the truck and yeah. they see that you're injured. They draw their guns. Your, you know, Anna gets taken away. What was your experience? Uh, first of all, what did you think uh, of the prospects of Black Summer when you got the role, did you have an idea that this might become a hit? That this had a good story behind it? Well, my my best friend DJ Qualls was on the um, Z Nation, which is, I guess, was dubbed a little bit of a prequel yeah. to it. Um, and so I knew that it had legs at the because that show did well. So I knew that the possibility of it having legs was there. Um, and I and I and I. That's kind of my jam too. I do like that kind of post-apocalyptic stuff. Mm -hmm. Not particularly, I'm not specifically zombies, but I do. I like a zombie here and there, mm -hmm. but I like post-apocalyptic stuff. So uh, I was jammed about that, and uh, and I uh, and I thought that it could do well, considering that the people had already had a formula with Z Nation. So um, 
And I was glad that, and I haven't watched it since, but I, I was glad that at least with the, the pilot episode that, that it was a little bit more grounded, a little bit more gritty. I like that. Um, I like my post-apocalyptic stuff to be gritty and, 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 and grounded. So um, I'm not surprised it did well. And I, I remember after uh, the scene where I die, I'm in the living room and I die before the zombie stuff and it's a real emotional scene. And they're like, wow, it's really good. I'm like, yeah, you should have made me a regular. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to get the the makeup put on and be a zombie and all that good stuff? Um, it's I you know, I, it's a love hate thing because you love you love to see it, but you hate to sit in the chair for it. <laughs> it's always so kind of uncomfortable and painful and time consuming, and you know they're in a rush to get it done, and you're like, yeah, but I can't. Uh, I need a drink of water, and uh, you know, uh, and the contacts you put in, you're like, okay, I can't see anything. <laughs> So, but, but when you do see the pictures, you're like, oh yeah. And it helps you get into character. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're playing a zombie, it helps to feel like a zombie and look like a zombie and, and the, the caked dried blood and stuff makes you feel like you've been in a, in, in a car accident. So it kind of helps that way. Um, but it's, you know, let's just say when Halloween comes around, I don't tend to pick heavily makeup characters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, movie. I can't believe how fast time is flying. You were in a very, you were in a great movie, an A and E movie, Flight ninety three, which was based oh, yeah. on the the real story that happened on nine eleven. Uh, how did you feel on taking on such a role, uh, based on such a very real event? Uh, it was a bit. I tell you, I mean, it was nerve wracking because we didn't, you know, on, a, on big budget features, you get to like. There's people that can hook you up with the family and hook you up with a lot of you know information and 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 people associated to the people. I I don't think at that up until that point I'd never played a, a, a real life historical figure. Yeah. But it's not just a historical figure like playing Abraham Lincoln. It's like if I do a bad job playing Abraham Lincoln, Abraham's not going to be upset about it. His family's probably not going to be upset about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I was playing somebody who's a contemporary of mine, who uh, who who died heroically in, in one of the nation's greatest, you know, tragedies yep. in the last hundred years. Um, and so the fear of not being like, I, I ended up meeting his mom, um, Mark Bingham's mom on um, Larry King. And it was the first time I met her and I felt terrified because the truth is I didn't have footage of him. I didn't have, I, I saw a picture, but I didn't have video of him. I, there was nothing for me to, so I couldn't play him. Yeah. I just had to play his the spirit of him mm -hmm. that they wrote into the script, and thankfully I think we, I think we did honor it and, and it did very well on Annie and I think we did honor it. You and, did a um, great job on that film. Thank thank you, but it, it was hard for me because I I mean and that again with a historical figure you've got you've got lots of records of that person especially if they were a famous person right like mm -hmm. if you're playing hitler you know what he looks like you got videos of him you know there's books and books and books and books and books you can read about him but these guys were citizens normal citizens that were thrust into this into this um, horrific situation and and there was no as the actor trying to portray him there was no resources yeah. for me certainly not at the time too it's like you auditioned one day and 3 4 days later you're on set mm -hmm. so, you know it's um, I always I, I saw this great um, local Vancouver actor. I, I wish I could remember who to credit this to, but he was like, I think we should give Oscars to people who do terrible scripts, to the actors who do terrible scripts, because that's the hardest thing. Or to do a TV movie, mm -hmm. you got three days. Wow. You don't have six months to prep your character. You don't have, you know, it's like sometimes you're doing you're doing a you know an a you're doing a Hallmark movie that, that's that's really great. And sometimes you're doing one that's not. Yeah. And sometimes you're doing a feature film that's got tons of money, but you're only getting three days to work on it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you, there's no perfect there's no perfect solution, but certainly when you're playing a real-life contemporary hero... You want man, to do wish... uh, respect the family, obviously. He was just yeah. an ordinary person, but yeah. they were heroes. And yeah. uh, there's no other way to describe how that played out. Did you seek the role out? Was it just an audition? Did you know what you were auditioning for? How did you land that role? Um, I did, it was it was just an audition, and um, and uh, I didn't read like again. You, you get it the night before. You prep it for the next day, 
you don't have a lot of time to like, thankfully you don't have a lot of time to let it settle in. I think, I think if I had realized how important that role was and how important this movie and the story was that night, I probably would have panicked the next day. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, uh, it's just, in a funny way. It's like, I just had to do my best as quickly as I could. Um, you load, you, you take two hours to research the situation and, and then, and then you make your choices and do your best. But, um, no, it wasn't a role that I pursued, but obviously when I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to be part of this. And I want to be part of this. But it's also scary to be part of it because how long do you wait to tell a story like that yeah. too, right? And like, they did it like five years after 9-11, I believe. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, there were great movies. I forgot the one, The Tower with Nicolas Cage that came out uh, at the World Trade Center. I forgot what that movie was called. He was great in that. Yeah. There were some good movies that came out. Now, moving on to some other stuff. Uh, here's a little trivia thing that's on the internet. You have appeared in uh, some of the most popular science fiction series in North America. X-Files, Stargate, SG-1, Smallville, Supernatural. Uh, it's just one of those quirky <laughs> trivia things. But out yeah. of all those, which one did you enjoy the most? Uh, now, the X-Files, uh, we're going back to the 90s now. I love the X-Files. I'm a huge fan of the X-Files. Let's take that one, for example. What was your experience like on that? X-Files was my very first, um, regardless of how it looks on the credits so on IMDb, X-Files was my very first professional TV booking. Wow. Uh, so I was uh, I'd come out of theater school. I did a year at the Shaw Festival doing theater. Uh, I come back. It was my and was my only my second film film and TV audition ever. Uh, and I come back my very my second audition. I booked doing playing X Files when it was huge at the time. Oh yeah. And uh, and uh, it's so funny because I was a young actor, just you know, starving young actor. Get on. To, and I remember I was um, um, my my wife at the time. Um, I I go and I do my day and I I come back. And she's like, so how was it? And all I could say was like the food was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> they had steak and like lobster, and because it was a Friday, it was a special day. They had a nice thing. Like and I was like, all I could talk about was the food. She's like, yeah, yeah, but how was the show? I'm like, super slow. <laughs> <laughs> Same stuff over and over again a thousand times. I ended up doing. I was in the 30 second teaser for the episode, and um, I ended up getting five days of work, and I think I made like five thousand dollars, and I was like. I mean, as a young, broke theater actor who just out of theater school was an understudy at Shaw Festival. Yeah. And so I did five days of work and got $5,000. I was like, I got fed steak. And like, we're on the X Files. <laughs> <laughs> and I promptly put on like 25 pounds in the next eight months. Oh, I, ended up, I ended up working a lot. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, starving artists, I'm like, I show up, I'm like, I better eat this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know when the next meal is coming. Exactly, man. You've been very outspoken uh, supporter of the arts, you know. Um, and I've read some of your past interviews, uh, and you have a real passion uh, for the arts. Is that an accurate description of yourself? I, I, yeah, I'd like to think so, yeah. <laughs> now, would you ever want to do, like, become a teacher, uh, teach acting down the line? Uh, what are your uh, aspirations moving forward in your career? Um, I think, uh, I, I used to do some teaching, but I, I, I stepped back from that and I, uh, I'd be interested in doing some directing in my, in the future. Um, I think t I have such, uh, respect and appreciation for teachers. I think that my career is due in part to, um, to teachers that have been in my life that kind of pushed me into acting when I was uh, a young, yeah. trouble troublesome kid. So, um, I think, um, I'd like to, I'd really like to direct and I don't, um, I th unfortunately I don't have that mindset to go get a project off the ground myself. And I just, I just know that I need somebody, I need producers. I need, I need somebody that does that technical stuff and, and that ha is savvy with that because it's either you're that self-motivated guy to push, 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 push and get a project made, or you're on a show long enough where they trust you as the actor to let you have a couple episodes. Yeah. And I think that's probably the more likely scenario for me. Um, 
but uh, I, I do think I have a great eye for storytelling. I think I do know how to talk to actors really well and get great performances out of them. And, and I am, um, and like anything, I'm now 47. I think I've, I've grown and matured. And I, I wow, we're I the same avoid... age. I'm turning 47 oh, cool. in two weeks. <laughs> oh, nice. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. That is so um, cool. Uh, if you if you think back, when did you find out that this is what you wanted to do, that you wanted to be an actor? And when you did, did you go to any kind of formal training, school, drama class, anything like that? So I've told this story before. I'll give you the quick version. In fact, I was just chatting with uh, this teacher on Messenger today. Uh, Judy Craig was my grade six, seven, eight teacher for drama and French at Rio Valley School in uh, Cars, Ontario. And I was um, I lived in a group home close by and went to that school. And I was um, I was a troublemaker kid. I used to show up to school with a forty ounce of vodka and a gram of hash in grade seven. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I came from a very messed up background, so I was an angry kid, and I was displaced a lot. And that had, I think that was my fourth home that I was in, fourth or fifth home. Um, and she took me under her wing, so to speak, and f basically forced me to audition for the school play. And um, and I played uh, Henny Penny, who's afraid the chicken was afraid the sky's gonna fall. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the next year, I played one of the evil stepsisters in Cinderella, and. And and I'm like I was this big kind of badass kid and uh, and she but I liked her so much that and I liked I didn't realize I liked acting but I I think I just did it because she liked she wanted me to do it but then I was also good at it yeah. and then she forced me, then she forced me to audition for an arts high school and this is a true story and I've told it many times and, I, and I, I'll never get tired of telling it because she deserves all the credit she said hey I think you should go to this high school Canterbury High School for the arts I went okay she's like okay well I'm gonna get you the application I went okay. And so she gets the application. It's got monologues, two monologues, and a couple other things in it. And she's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to coach you on this. And she coached me. And, and then she's like, okay, I'm going to drive you 45 minutes to the audition in Ottawa. And she drove me to the audition, drove me back, prepped me for it. Three weeks later, we get a message I wasn't accepted oh. because my grades were too poor. Oh. And she, she calls them and says, hey, wh she, why didn't he get accepted? He's fantastic. And I go, no, his acting's fantastic. But his grades are so poor, we can't bring him out of the cashman. And she said, I'm going to tutor him. And she tutored me. Wow. And uh, she, I, I always get emotional when I say it. She tutored me and got me into the program. And I spent uh, five years in that program uh, preparing for theater school, which I eventually did in Vancouver at uh, a place called Studio 58. That is but such she a great is, story. She did my life. So, I mean, yeah. that is somebody who, I mean, can you ask for anybody to believe in you any more than that? I mean, wow, that is, yeah. that's an amazing, and here you are all these years later, you have a huge resume, any regrets? What, do you, what would you say is your biggest regret looking back um, on your career, if any? Uh, they say it's not worth having regrets, but you know, I've made plenty of mistakes that I, that I do regret and I, and I hope someday I can move past them and not let them kind of live in the back of my brain. Well, what, um, let, let me ask you this more specific question. I've had, uh, some actors say when I've asked them this question that they think they might've self-sabotaged an audition. Do you feel you've ever might've done that? Oh yeah, but I, I think you know. I think that come, that's par for the course with uh, with actors. You always, you're eventually going to have a few of those. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there was a time when I I don't I don't think I maximized my potential. Um, and I didn't stay focused and disciplined enough. I think there was times when I let my ego get ahead of me. Um, and I, I think um, I think there was times I wish I could have been kinder and gentler, uh, with with other people, and myself. And um, I think, I think uh, there's times when I wasn't I, I, like when I, I didn't realize even when I started the first time somebody ever looked at me and recognized me as an actor. I thought and I came from a pretty messed up background. I, I thought he was eyeballing me like he wanted to fight. Yeah. So I, you know, so I started giving him an eye like, do you want to go? <laughs> and so, and I think there's some truth to that that I didn't realize like when I started becoming recognizable, I didn't realize that people were starting to look up to me in my community. I didn't realize the influence that I had 
on on other, on other people and i think uh, sometimes it was positive and sometimes it was negative and so um because you don't you don't you don't see yourself you know what i mean like you don't see a friend of mine said this, and I think there's some truth to it. He goes, people think that you change when you become famous, but the truth is people around you change first. Mm-hmm. You, they start kind of, treating you differently. Yeah, and 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 I, was, and I was too stupid to notice that people were looking, maybe some of the people in my community were looking up to me. And so uh, I, I, and I wasn't ready to be a role model. I mean, I, wasn't, mm-hmm. I don't think I was ready to understand um, yeah, I, I I totally understand what you're saying. It's the people around you, even those that you've known your whole life, just start treating you differently. Uh, and I think it's done subconsciously. And, uh, and then you realize that you know you have a responsibility now. Like you, like you said, you became a role model in your community. People start looking up to you. If you did grow up as the bad boy, the the class clown. That's not really what you want to pass down to kids yeah. and your kids well, and whatnot. You know, everybody's going through your, your your human experience. You know, you're you're growing and, and learning about yourself and and your past and how it affects you and how it makes you make good decisions or bad decisions. And you know, and you start to um, you. But when, it's like I feel so terrible for, for people who are true, like massive celebrities who grow up. Uh, in the limelight it's like and they make mistakes for everybody to see yeah. you know you don't you don't realize that um man we're all still growing up yeah. you know we're all still figuring things out and we're all carrying the baggage of our past with us and and things that you don't realize like yeah i just i didn't i just didn't realize like i'll tell you there was a time when i was single for a period of time and, and i and it, i didn't realize it for a while and it dawned on me like when when I, people would be interested in dating me, I'm like, are you interested in dating me because you like me and you think I'm funny and charming and kind? and Or are you dating me because I'm on TV? Exactly. And so that became a real weird thing. And and, and that and that goes with a ton of stuff, yeah. you know? You say something and people interpret it wrong because you don't realize that they're hanging on your words mm-hmm. or, or that, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, it's just, yeah. And I'm, you know. Yeah, I totally, I, just, yeah, so- I totally, I mean, I get it, I get it, I understand, and uh, it's weird. Uh, I guess that's the only real word to uh, describe it. It's it's really yeah. weird. Ty, I can't believe this hour has just flown by. Uh, I I feel we can sit here and talk for hours. Thank you so much for well, coming pleasure. on here and sharing. Uh, I love it when I get uh, like people like yourself who share and are open and not afraid to share good and bad things from your past. I think it's refreshing. And I think we need a lot more of that openness and discussion. And I think you're awesome. And I want to thank Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Thank you. for. It's been our pleasure to have you here. Thank you to our viewers for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this hour as much as me and Ty have. Uh, Any final thoughts before we go you want to share with your fans or the audience? Uh, I just wanted to say, everybody, stay healthy, stay safe, get vaccinated. We're almost through this, and I know what a difficult time it is for everybody uh, globally. Yeah. And I think we just um, try to be kind to each other, be gentle with yourself, take care of yourself, and uh, and and we'll get through this together. And keep growing, keep healing. Absolutely. Lots of love. Thank you so much, Ty. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. Until next time, on behalf of Ty Olson and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night. Thank you, guys.